After a week of experimenting and tweaking with custom firmware, I've actually managed to get all my designs working. So here's my MBW1 design. On the left we've got a chip scan done by Olivier at Texplained, and on the right you can see all the different designs. You can see that all our designs are quite small, and I think that might be why they're working. The main issue with MPW1 was hold violations due to clock skew, but you can't get much clock skew if your design is really small. The other design's authors have samples on the way, so I'm waiting to see if they manage to get their designs working too. By the way, if you want to find out more about these designs, I've put together a documentation pack that I'm sending out with samples, and you can check that out here. Okay, so let's see all my designs in action. We'll start off with a seven segment display. I covered this a bit in my previous video, so if you want to find out more about it, check that one. One of the reasons I started with this is because the multiplexer defaults to this project when it starts up. So moving on to the multiplexer, this just multiplexes all the inputs and outputs of all the designs. It's got a wishbone address, so by writing to a memory location, I can change which design is active. You can see I had to make it quite big to fit all the pins around the outside. This RISC-V assembly snippet shows activating the WS2812 design, which is number one. So moving on to the WS2812 driver, this driver makes it easy for a microcontroller to drive these intelligent WS2812 LEDs. They have a serial data protocol and you can put a lot of them in one long chain. The problem is because the serial data protocol doesn't have a clock, your timing has to be quite precise. And that means if your microcontroller is working on the timings, it doesn't leave much time for doing other work. So that's why I thought it might be a good idea to tape something out like this on MPW1. The design is parametric, so you can set the number of LEDs you want. For MPW1, I just set it to eight. To interact with the driver, you write to memory on the wishbone address. The top eight bits choose the LED and the bottom 24 bits choose the red, green and blue colors. Here I'm setting the green on the last LED and then the red on the next one and then the blue on the one after that. Now I'll set them all off and uncomment this little animation that I wrote. Please excuse my RISC V assembly, I really don't like it. We can't use C unfortunately because we don't have a stack and we don't have a stack because the SRAM didn't work. So some nice blinky animations. Okay, let's move on to the TPM2137 Capture the Flag chip challenge. Q3K is a member of Dragon Sector, a Polish security capture the flag team. He came up with this cool capture the flag for reverse engineering an FPGA binary that I was able to solve with formal tools. I thought it would be cool to take this out on MPW1 and issue a similar challenge. The first person that can reverse engineer the password from the GDS and show how they did it can win a free ticket to my course. To show this design I set up a logic analyzer capturing the serial data being sent and then the two lock lines. This is the Python program that sets things up. First we reset the design, set the voltages, load the firmware, take it out of reset, wait for a bit, configure the UART, and then we send the wrong password, wait, and then send the good password. And in the firmware, here's the I.O. configuration, and then here's the part where we enable that project. So we're capturing the data now, and there we see the bad and the good password, if we take a, a closer look here. So the device starts off locked and we send a, ba a bad password, eight characters, nothing changes. And then one second later, we send the correct password. And as soon as the last character is received, the lock opens. Finally, we've got the VGA clock. This was the design that I was most excited to have, but it was the one I thought was the least likely to work because it needs a 31.5 megahertz clock. Like the seven segment counter, I can't enable all the pins, but I've got enough of the pins working that I can still see all the digits on the clock, just not the right colors. One interesting thing was that when I increased the clock frequency from 25 to 31 megahertz so that it would keep accurate time, the VGA panel stopped getting a lock. By slightly increasing the voltage supplied to the design, I was able to get that working again. So it's quite a nice example of seeing how a faster clock needs more power. 
I hooked up the scope so that I could take a look at the video timings. And you can see here the horizontal sync and the vertical sync. Horizontal sync is in blue and the vertical is in purple. Zooming in a bit further, everything looks good. And then a little bit further still. And this is still looking good, matches the simulation. But here things are a little bit strange. The vertical sync should be changing on a rising clock edge, but you can see from the scope it looks like it's changing on a falling clock edge. And we get the same thing with the horizontal sync. So I'm not totally sure what that's to do with, but if you've got any ideas, and put them in the comments. And here's the clock counting, so the colours aren't quite right, but it's showing the time, which is great. And then I connected up some buttons, and by pressing the buttons I can set the time. Every minute the colour cycles. So it was really great to see all my designs working, definitely exceeded my expectations, and I'm really excited to see what we get out of MPW2 when we had a lot of designs from the course on there. So stay tuned and I'll see you on the next video.